Good afternoon, everyone. I am Gabe Albornoz, and we are convening this afternoon's session as a joint committee session of our county's Economic Development Committee and Health and Human Services Committees. I am joined by my colleague and chair of our Economic Development Committee, uh, Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez, and members of both committees who are all here and present this afternoon. We are here to discuss Bill 4223, Health and Sanitation, Menstrual Products in Public Restrooms Required. We are also joined by our colleague, Councilmember Will Jawanda, who is the lead sponsor of this bill. Uh, I'd like to begin with a point of privilege. Um, this joint committee session had to be rescheduled from a few weeks ago uh, due to the death of a member of my family. And I want to express my deep appreciation to all of my colleagues and staff for the condolences you all passed, which meant a great deal of me, to me and to my family. Uh, and also thank you for your flexibility. So jumping in here, uh, from time to time, I will bring up bills uh, around the dinner table so that my kids can kind of hear about what we're talking about and debating before the county council. And sometimes those bills generate a healthy discussion and sometimes silence. Um, this one generated some healthy discussion, and I really want to really want to thank uh, Councilmember Jawando for once again uh, uplifting an issue that really deserves more attention, and very thoughtfully uh, bringing forward a bill that uh, helps address the concerns and needs uh, of a very 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 important segment of our population. Um, in individual conversations with all of my colleagues and uh, in speaking to the lead sponsor and in speaking to uh, the county government staff it has become clear that there are understandably a number of questions questions related to scope questions related to need questions related to cost as well as oversight and capacity and so it is unlikely um, that we will be able to answer all of those questions today and so today's session will just be a work session and we will see where that takes us at the end of this very important conversation and where that takes us will determine whatever the next steps may be. I want to thank Ms. Wellens, uh, who is feverishly trying to text members of the executive branch and I will buy her a little bit more time for um, your very thoughtful approach uh, to this very important issue. I think um, I also want to thank the advocates and the, the numerous people that testified before this body, uh, I learned a great deal and continue to learn a great deal. Uh, my, one of my favorite parts of this job is I learn something new every five minutes, sometimes every five seconds. Um, but with that, I will now turn it over to Ms. Wellens to kind of tee this up. Um, actually, before I do that, I apologize. Uh, I will turn it over to the lead sponsor of the bill, Councilmember Jawando, uh, to make some opening comments. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair Albernaz and to Chair Fanny Gonzalez uh, for and to the committee members. Uh, really appreciate being here today. Really appreciate your comments. Uh, and uh, this too was an issue that uh, I was educated on. As I mentioned when I introduced the bill, uh, one of our summer interns last year, uh, Lulu August, uh, suggested this and brought these issues up. Um, and she's uh, in her second year uh, at, at Harvard right now and we dug into it over the summer and i i was frankly you know just taken aback by how much has been done in this area in the need um and so i was really excited to ha introduce the bill uh, i think the public hearing was really robust uh, i've talked to colleagues about that and and to your point i think uh, a lot of us are have learned a lot and as as the father of three daughters and with an amazing uh, wife at home and so many others and as a civil rights lawyer uh, this was something that struck a chord with me as equitable access um, the just a couple points I want to make and then we I'd love look forward to jumping into the discussion uh, this was a public health initiative <laughs> um, it is it's uh, while there are economic and uh, you know obviously financial and other aspects that we're going to discuss at its core this is about public health um, and equity uh, and it's going to require multiple interventions you know there's not one thing that will solve this uh, the main approaches thus far to menstrual equity have been to repeal unfair uh, taxes 
uh, on menstrual products and to improve access in correctional facilities and in schools and in temporary shelters. Those are all really good steps for some of our most vulnerable populations. Uh, Maryland has done those, has done all four. It's in various processes and as far as the schools. But uh, period poverty, which we defined in our public hearing and is defined here in the packet, uh, it still exists and we need to do more. Uh, this is a matter of public health that affects or will affect or has affected uh, over half of our population um, and, it, and it's a daily occurrence. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to bring up. Uh, why, why now and why this? And it's a valid question. I've heard it from a lot of people in the course of the last few months. Um, one of the testimonies we heard on December 12th, which was also captured in the packet, um, said whether you see it or not, the need is there. It's often a need that's attached to stigma and shame. So people often suffer quietly. Um, and I, that really has stuck out to me uh, when you look at the data about this and when you heard from some of our young people uh, in MCPS and others who have organized whole organizations around this issue, um, there is a real need. Um, over one third of low income women, 38% have reported missing work, school or similar events due to lack of period supplies. Nearly seven in 10 people agree that period poverty is a public health issue, yet only 4% of Americans are aware of a local resource where free or reduced cost period supplies are available. 27% um, of respondents said that COVID-19 pandemic made it difficult to access period products. And a quarter of black and Latina people, 23 and 24% respectively, who have periods strongly agree that they've struggled to afford period products in the last year, a quarter of, of black and Latino Latina residents. Um, so while this, and then the final point I wanna make, this bill will have a great impact on low-income residents who are more likely to find themselves without menstrual products. But it's also focused on meeting the needs of everyone who menstruates. Uh, some of the best people I've, conversations I've had were with companies like uh, Wegmans and others who have voluntarily decided to put menstrual products in their bathrooms for the use, not just of the public, but of their employees. Uh, we have many, many employees in this county uh, who are fall in this category. So. Uh, I, I appreciate the concerns that have been expressed by our business community, uh, but just wanted to round this out that it's a public health issue. I know we'll talk about how best to approach it, uh, but I'm very happy that I think colleagues have understood the importance of this and I'm hopeful we can come to a, a good resolution that moves it forward. So thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd now like to turn it over to Ms. Wellens to sort of provide some scope and context and kind of walk us through what we will be discussing this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I believe that we have representatives of relevant agencies here, uh, with the exception, I believe that uh, Director Stowe is on his way. Um, if you'd like to start out with introductions. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. I'm Kenny Welch, I'm with DHHS, Licensure and Regulatory Services. I'm the Senior Administrator. Hi, Dr. Nina Ashford, Chief of Public Health Services with HHS. Grace Pedersen from the Office of Management and Budget, in case there's any questions. Great. My name is Gregory Boykin. I'm the Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer in the Department of General Services. Awesome. Yeah. So I think we are well covered here once particularly when Mr. Stowe arrives, but go ahead, yes. Ms. Wellens. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just provide a brief overview of some other rel existing relevant laws related to the issue um, and then give you just in some like broad strokes some of the kind of fundamental issues that you might want to consider in relation to this bill and fortunately we have the um, wealth of knowledge here um, from the health department dgs uh, mr so on his way and omb who they all worked very hard to provide um, fiscal impact information related to the bill, among other, among other input. Um, so um, the committee may be aware of this, and just to provide some general context, um, on page two of the staff memorandum, there are some other um, local laws or state laws noted related to uh, providing menstrual products and uh, period equity issues. Uh, one is that under the education article of the Maryland Code, 
uh, public schools are being required to install mental hygiene product dispensers in certain restaurants, restaurants, excuse me, certain uh, restrooms for students. Um, and that is kind of like a progressive phase in implementation. Um, MCPS is scheduled to have um, the products in all women's restrooms in public secondary schools by August 1, 2025. Um, it's also the law in the state of Maryland that incarcerated individuals must have access to free menstrual supplies. Um, and another aspect of the state law is that Maryland exempts from the sales tax, sanitary pads, tampons, menstrual sponges, menstrual cups, or other similar feminine hygiene products. Um, there's also just for context, again, a useful uh, sort of compendium of laws throughout different states um, that was prepared by the ACLU and you can link to it through the packet. In terms of some of the global issues that the committee might want to begin to consider, um, as you know, the way that the bill was originally drafted, it would apply to a subgroup of places of public accommodation. And public places of public accommodation is defined quite broadly um, under existing law. So the idea was to look at only those places of public accommodation that are required by law already to provide uh, restrooms to the public. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> part of the confusion is that, um, at least surprisingly to me, that is it's very hard to identify with pre precision those entities that are required um, to provide restrooms to the public. There are a few types of entities that are called out in county law, including um, you know, uh, food service facilities with on-site consumption. So restaurants are clearly covered. Oddly, tanning salons and campgrounds are covered. Um, but aside from that, what we learned in sort of dis discussing this with DPS is that really it, it's a determination of the WSSC of when the restrooms need to be provided. Um, therefore, the county, the county folks, our, our regulators don't have necessarily ready access to that information. So obviously that poses a confusion, not only for enforcement, but for the public and, you know, most importantly, uh, the public of knowing whether they are or, not, or are not subject to the requirement. So along those lines, um, I guess a fundamental issue for the committee would be if you move forward with this law to just determine the scope. And the council staff suggestion would be, I mean, you could approach it in, with various options. One option would be, okay, stick with places of public accommodation, but don't, define, don't use that broad definition. Don't use the restriction about whether they're required to um, have uh, restaurants, but rather define very specifically the types of entities that we're talking about um, so that it's clear to everyone. Um, that would be one option if you wanted to continue with the public accommodations route. Another option would be to, you know, focus first on county buildings. That would be a potential um, idea. Um, and within that, you know, you could even look at a subset of county buildings such as those that are more public facing. Um, and that sort of leads to the fiscal impact analysis of the bill, um, which again, OMB um, and the other agencies have been very helpful in collecting. If you can see on, it's in the fiscal impact statement, but also summarized at page seven of the staff memorandum, um, you see what fiscal impacts would be, would be anticipated if um, these products were supplied in various groups of uh, or yeah, various groups of or types of county buildings. Um, on page eight, there is a chart laying out the fiscal impact if uh, the law were to focus on uh, libraries and recreation centers in particular, with the idea that those are are you know public facing uh, facilities. Um, I'm going to stop there. There is also just uh, there was a clear there was a clarification that. Um, that the bill, if, if it moves forward, would be enforceable through Class A civil violations as opposed to criminal violations. Um, so I'll stop there and see if there are questions. Thank you.
Thank you. Just logistically, colleagues, just to try to get my attention, and I'll put you in the queue if, if you if you have a question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start. Um, and before we get to scope, um, and you brought up some very thoughtful and reasonable issues that we're gonna have to think through, I, w I still want to um, focus on on area of need. Um, so, Dr. Ashford, I'm going to turn to you and welcome. By the way, this is the first time you've had an opportunity to testify before this body since you were uh, sworn in. So, thank you so much for for your public service. But, um, are you aware, or could we ascertain um, the scope of where these products are currently being distributed, vis-a-vis -vis nonprofit organizations, our uh, hubs? Um, other service providers, is there a way, in your opinion, and I know you've only been here less than a month, and if any of my colleagues um, on from the dais could, could potentially respond to this as well, or if this is just one of those questions we need to get back to, that's okay too. Um, but just your thoughts on uh, getting our hands on where these products are already being distributed. We, we know that there's already some state mandates, um, but any other areas that you're aware of? Um, I think this is one where I will have to get back to you on it. I don't n believe that that data is being collected in any systematic way at the current moment, but um, we need to reach out to some of our uh, programs and partners to try and collect that in a more systematized way. That's great. So wh while we are uh, deliberating over this in this and, and, and subsequent work sessions, uh, it would be good to just you know have that information and then make sure it's it's disseminated in a way that people can process and digest. Um, which I think would would be helpful and also might help determine strategically uh, if if we do compromise on some level and and don't go to the full extent of what the bill is currently proposing um, you know where, where we would need to, to focus where, where geographically and whatnot so that would be great um, with regards to the definition um, I guess if my colleagues uh, also from the county could just sort of uh, highlight and uplift the potential challenges that this may pose as you know the definition there's a, some ambiguity here um, but if you could expand on Ms. Wellen's comments uh, that would be helpful and then if there's anything similar uh, that we are currently have oversight of you know and, I, and I'm talking about private sector we'll get with within county government buildings but just out in the public um, any thoughts or uh, expansion of what Ms. Wellen said there the only thing that I can reference at this point um, basically was a conversation that I had with Director Stowe regarding the inclusive uh, the restrooms. Um, we feel that we haven't been able to reach to majority of the businesses that possibly fall under that category of compliance. Um, and the reason for that is because we don't know who they are. We don't know how to contact them. So this would fall much in that vein as well. Um, he estimated, Dr. Director Stowe estimated, he had a list of 52,000 businesses that this may impact. I don't, I'm not sure how we get a hold of all these 52,000 businesses that could be impacted by this bill. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I think given the ambiguity of you know how we define this and 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 reaching you know potentially those 52,000 businesses which you know just reaching them would have its own operational costs I think it might be productive um, to focus for now in this conversation on the buildings that the county is the most responsible for uh, the public buildings um, because as Ms. Wellens noted and in private conversations I've had with colleagues there's uh, real interest in, in looking at uh, public buildings um, but before I start focusing on those I will pause here and see if any of my colleagues have any questions or thoughts on what's been discussed thus far okay great um, Councilmember Lukey from f in my office last summer I received correspondence from a middle school and a high school student who were inquiring about the state law regarding to provision of the products in in public school bathrooms um, and it has a tiered you know rollout as to when it has to all be done 
um, but they noted that their schools were in fact out of compliance with the you know with what was supposed to be done and so I forwarded it to um, our MCPS chief medical officer Dr. Kapunin and to um, the Board of Ed president and send a response back to the students about the law about how the tiered in rollout is supposed to go on and you know that I was passing it along to the people who actually have to implement it um, in there I asked you know uh, to, that they should provide the council with an update right in you know what the compliance or gaps were with the October 1st 2022 deadline which was the first tier timeline the progress toward meeting the August 1st 2025 deadline which I believe is the one where you have to have it for with the elementary schools um, because our elementary school students are already menstruating um, and an explanation of the processes and procedures to know whether existing dispensers are regularly stocked with appropriate products and ensuring appropriate supplies on an ongoing basis so I never got a response still haven't gotten a response um, what I can tell you from having children in middle and high school is that the dispensers are routinely emptied and where they're put out whoever gets there first takes all the things and then there's nothing for anyone else so we heard a lot of testimony from our teenagers in particular who came here which is true you know if you, you when it's a newer thing and it may not be as consistent on its arrival right every woman in the room knows this um, you might need to find yourself with supplies and to get some supplies that you didn't think about when you left the house that morning right and that's what the state bill attempting to deal with this issue within our k-12 public schools was aimed at doing and yet even that isn't functioning as it was intended um, and so you know I'd be I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about when when this type of thing happens and it's just sitting there for whomever encounters it to take how can you adequately make sure that person who has the need the people who are actually experiencing period poverty are the ones who are getting the things they need right because otherwise other people may just be taking things that that and they're not reaching the intended recipients if you will so do you have any thoughts about that I mean my initial thoughts are kind of getting to council member Alvernaz's comment about seeing a where are where do we have community partners that are already providing these services but then looking at it from the equity perspective of we know that individuals who face period poverty tend to be our black and brown communities with lower socioeconomic status i think this is one of those things where unfortunately if you make a service available to everyone right everyone has access to it and that's not a bad thing but i think given that we have finite resources really being able to target maybe by zip code looking at our equity reports and the other data and metrics within hhs if we think about a phased rollout whatever that might be whether that's government or county buildings to begin with or if we want to think more broadly beyond that um really using the data to try and target where we would make the services available, um, but that doesn't alleviate the very real challenge that you point out, council member Lugie, about, um, you know, someone could go in there and grab all of them. But I think being strategic about really focusing in high need areas, if that is the, the strata that we would want to use, um, if we're going to go beyond saying we're going to start with county buildings right and I mean you know to be fair it shouldn't be treated as anything different than right like I'm, I'm picking up some groceries I'm picking up some stuff you need and this is just one of those things that that we need and I should be able to get that too if I'm obtaining these other things at hubs for example or through our other community-based partners who have ongoing relationships with those most likely in need that this is just routinely provided as a part of that for any household where it is applicable yes okay thank you I had a comment towards your question we we thought about this and the thing that occurred to us was privacy concerns. You can have different kind of dispensers which dispense one thing at a time and so that there's a delay. You can also have dispensers which operate off tokens so that if you had this in a library or rec center, a person could gain a token from there and operate it that way. That became a little bit of a privacy issue, but our focus was on the type of dispenser because we had thought about this too, someone taking everything all at once. But those are the type of things we've considered. 
Yeah, thank you. I mean, like, certainly I, I agree because you don't want to create the, I have to go up to the librarian and ask mm -hmm. on the sly for my token, right? But but it, it should legitimately just be, I have the need, this is where I'm going, I get assistance with my other needs, I'm able to get what I need here fully for me as a woman who, who menstruates or as a, as a woman who has a child who menstruates and I need to help them and I'm able to get what I want and it should be no more stigma than anything else that we experience or have and shouldn't require that going to separately in a p place of public accommodation to try and ask for a token to access the item. So, um, and Director Snow, I see you've arrived. Thank you so much. Why don't you come on down in, in case the question comes up. And we're just uh, still in the background and context phase of this conversation, Director Stowe. Um, so I think maybe as a follow-up, it might be helpful to um, ask those organizations once we receive that scope how they dispense the products and what lessons learned they have had. Um, that could be true both of our nonprofit and public partners, but also our private partners as well. Legwins was mentioned, I think there are a couple of other uh, private partners that, that have been doing this on their own. Uh, gleaning any information from them on, on recommendations I think would be helpful. Uh, Councilmember Balcom. Thank you. Uh, and I also want to thank Council Member Jawando for bringing this forward. Um, and um, as uh, Chair said, uh, you know, some bills have a lot of discussion, some bills don't. This one has had a lot of discussion about um, uh, how and why and, and when. And um, some people are adamantly in favor, and some people are scratching their heads wondering what this is all about so I appreciate that um, and so I, I have a, just a couple thoughts for me the primary issue is uh, period poverty um, I completely agree that we need to that the county needs to um, help support the resources for our community in need uh, just like we are um, not only the county but our nonprofit organizations are stepping up um, so um, for instance we I'm visiting our community schools they many uh, they have pantries and those pantries are stocked with period products uh, and our hubs ha uh, provide period products uh, maybe not in a um, a consistent way and and I think that that's something that we need to look at um, so I fully support the need to uh, look at period poverty the the issue of wide distribution versus targeted distribution so when we think about period poverty and we think about having access to menstrual products in public places I see that those are two different things because um, when we when we look at the logistics of how many times a, a young woman a girl or, or woman is menstruating in a public place where they need um, resources that is a very small fraction of the total amount of resources that they're going to need every month for their for their um, for their period and so even if we did provide um, resources products in public places um, that's not solving the overall need it's it's solving the 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 issue of inconvenience um, and it might provide, you know, one tampon or one napkin for that one time that they they happen to be at the library or at, at at a restaurant, but it's not providing all of their needs. So I th I I think that there's a disconnect um, between um, you know once in a while you need this product while you're out. Um, so I I think I made that point. Um, so that's so that's an issue. Um, the other the other issue is um, I think it is important to look at the exper the experience of MCPS um, and other places that are distributing. So since this has come up, I'm more aware of where when 
products are available. Certainly, for instance, this building, we have products available, um, not only on, in our offices, but for the public. Um, so I had an experience. I was at the Listener Auditorium at George Washington University. The products were there in a dispensary readily available. I was at the Tacoma Park, uh, uh, was it a middle school, middle where, school. We had, where we had the, um, the public hearing. The dispenser was there, and it was empty. Right, so it's it that that to me is an issue of um, enforcement of it's it's going to be a difficult thing to enforce if there aren't products available. Are there are the products not available because somebody just took the last one, or are products not available because they haven't been available for the past six weeks? So I think that's an issue that we need to think about from an enforcement perspective. Um, those are two things. Um, I also think from the business communication perspective, this is an ongoing issue that we've had since the dawn of time of how do we communicate with our businesses. We don't, the county doesn't have access to, uh, we don't know the businesses. We'll have to work with the state in terms of finding, uh, reaching those businesses, not only from a notification perspective, but then, um, and I'm sure this is uh, complaint-based enforcement um, so we need to think about that um, I, I just was really surprised by the whole um, who decides when a restroom is necessary and that's the, you know the, the WSSC so how does DPS when DPS issues a permit how do they know w whether a restroom is required This is a great question, and I'm not sure that we have a DPS representative here, unfortunately. Right, because when because DPS is the one that issues the permit. DPS is the one that d determines whether whether uh, the certificate of occupation. Right, so at some point, some information needs to be shared from WSSC to DPS to say a, a restroom is legally required to be here so I think that's a that's a piece that I would like to have more information on if you know as we go forward um, I, I just thought that that was an interest and I'm sure that's a throwback to you know whether there were you know when the sewers were available or the plumbing was available sure. so um, that is a odd um, perhaps a remnant that I think we just need more information on how that works. I'm happy uh, to follow up. On um, thank you. And that's, those are my issues for now. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councilmember Sales followed by Councilmember uh, Juando and then Chair Fani Gonzalez. Councilmember Sales. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I share in the sentiments of my colleagues. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Juando for bringing this up and glad we're having this uh, discussion. My immediate concern was regarding the impact on businesses and given the number, you know, I was thinking of restaurants and thinking about all the businesses, 52,000, and we were just commiserating on how often women menstruate mm -hmm. and how uh, many products they do go through um, and um, just thinking about that price tag. I cannot even imagine. I know we estimated the price tag just for the county buildings at what almost two million and that's um, it's just thinking about the buildings is it our rec centers our county facing buildings public buildings then I started thinking about the population of women that work for our county government and I don't know if we have that number available. How many the female number. employees we have here in the county. I alone. don't have that, but I could look okay. into it. Yeah, just thinking about, you know, in-house in the public and how often we would have to, and I think uh, the uh, fiscal note was for one position to stock and supply the entire county, all county public facing buildings or internally. And then I started thinking, well, who would be responsible for this price tag? Would it be, you know, general funds? Would it be by department? And what is the accountability measure to hold the different departments accountable? And 
it, it begs the question um, of the feasibility of this bill and um, learning that, you know, even in MCPS, we're not able to account or um, um, track and monitor their stocking of these products. Um, it, it just seems um, unsustainable. Um, and so um, I did want to ask about the Yes. Did we compare the um, difference between just the county-owned buildings and the public-facing ones, what that cost would be, or was this price tag estimated for only public-facing county building? Um, so to repeat your question, you're wondering the fiscal impact of yeah. um, the cost to the county versus the cost to private entities? No, no, no. Uh, I was wondering was the fiscal impact encompassing all county buildings or just the public facing ones? Um, I because you know we have you know the private golf clubs I'm thinking about the air park um, just thinking about which county buildings did we? I believe it was an overall estimate. We um, sourced the data from several different um, departments. So DGS answered on behalf of all the, the county administered buildings. Then we asked um, Park and Planning, Montgomery College, um, and MCPS. Um, so it was kind of just a overall broad estimate of the number of bathrooms in each of the facilities they manage. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe a real formal inventory has been done of the bathrooms in each of these facilities. So yeah. it was an estimate just seemed a bit low um, the estimate so I would love some clarification on that number I'll say well. um, the estimate was uh, approximately um, it was a little bit more than half of all the buildings estimated in those facilities because we were assuming about half of the bathrooms were women and then the women's bathrooms and then there was another percentage maybe 10% that were like unisex or family bathrooms. I thought all so of our bathrooms are unisex county owned in county building no. no so well ours aren't but i thought yeah, single, single occupancy. only single occupancy okay. okay okay so we tried to give a realistic estimate of the fiscal impact by removing um the cost of men's rooms um but that's um clarified in the bill as well that that would be a caveat um update those numbers for or um this is a it. caveat, for example, if you wanted to provide um, equity for um, non-binary individuals that might use men's bathrooms, um, but the, mm. the cost estimated in the bill was for women's unisex and family bathrooms. Okay, okay. Another, another perspective to consider. Um, the final question, I'm sorry. Um, Well, I guess the question, the other question, I don't know if, uh, who would answer this, whether the county would be responsible and what that procurement option would look like, or would it be each separate department responsible if we broke it down in that manner? Oh, if it would be um, like a centralized approach? But, yes, um, yes, or so would DP planning each have to do their own procurement process? Um, so, for example, uh, DGS would manage the, the county buildings okay. that they currently, um, I believe they have contracts for some of the buildings, so um, they would, I, when I last spoke to them, they were working out the specifics of okay. how that would work, okay. um, but the overarching headers, like Montgomery College would manage the bathrooms under their jurisdiction, and MCPS would manage their own bathrooms. Um, the county level DGS would do it. It wouldn't be... Um, like o in OMB's office, we would okay. have someone that would do it. It would be DGS run. Okay. I can speak specifically um, to the DGS oh good. operated it's buildings. Okay. Yeah. The buildings that, that we operate like? have custodial contracts with mm. them, and our intent is to simply supply those products along with our regular custodial products, such as toilet tissue, yeah. um, hand wipes, and things, right? Mm -hmm. And then they would be stocked and restocked by our custodial staff in the buildings that we're responsible for. Mm. And that would cover all departments for the buildings we're responsible for. Okay. Okay. 
All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm going to go to Chair Fani Gonzalez and then Councilmember Chuando since Chair Fani Gonzalez has not had an opportunity to speak yet. He actually told me to go before him. <laughs> um, um, good afternoon. And uh, I want to say thank you to Councilmember Wildewondo for um, introducing the topic here in, in front of the County Council. I, when I first read about it, the first thing that popped in my head was when I came to the States, you know, when I was 16 years old, and my, I came along with my mom, and we didn't have any money. And I literally, my mom, I used to go to a church, and they would donate these products to my mom and I so I could use them. So that was my experience. But I grew up in a household with a very strong mother and father. They, they were both feminists. So this whole um, perception or of, of not talking about your period, that didn't exist to me. Like, I have my period. I'm a human being. I need something. <laughs> and I would just ask for it. So. So I, that's, I guess that's very cultural for my family, but it's not like that for everybody. Because there's a stigma still, which is so sad. So that's, I want to mention that because I think as a county, we should take this opportunity to talk more about this, okay? Also now as a mom, I'm also thinking of, you know, when you don't have enough money to buy diapers, you know, which is the opposite. So it's just having that need of making sure that you keep your family healthy because you need menstrual products and you need diapers to take care of, of, of your children and those are expensive too. So, um, so I'm coming in with that perspective um, and also understanding that we, we do have a responsibility. I also have children in, in the Montgomery County Public School System and I have a daughter and I go out like uh, Council Member Don Luke, you mentioned, um, I go out to different schools and I'm always, especially after this bill was introduced, I'm always asking and walking into the bathroom just to see. And to this day, I haven't seen a single bathroom, and you mentioned it too with Tacoma Park Middle School, that has menstrual products, not a single one. And then when I asked my daughter and her friends, because they told me, well, mommy, it's like if we see them, no, not her, but you know, when the kids see them, they just take them. You know, so to me, that's red flag number one, because we want to solve the problem. Solving the problem is not just saying we're going to have dispensaries and we're going to place them there. Solving the problem is not a band-aid. Solving a problem is to see how we can make sure that we eliminate the stigma, stigma, right, as a society. And, and two, like having places where you can go and just get them whenever you need them when you're low income. You can say, well, not like, like I spend ten dollars a month for my own menstrual products. That's that may be not a big deal, ten bucks, but for somebody struggling, ten dollars is it's a big deal. So I kind of want to see how we can frame this in a way that instead of talking about public bath bathrooms, maybe you know we have a whole bunch of nonprofits here that do provide these products, but they don't provide enough. So yes, we're gonna have milk and rice and diapers, but let's also have plenty of menstrual products. And then having an assistant, and I think that gets to your point, Councilmember Balcom, where you are providing then for a for a month or for three months or for maybe a whole year, if you're if you can show that you're low income, instead of thinking, oh my God, tomorrow I'm gonna have my period. If you're like me, you're like very, you're like that day is gonna happen. Um, like say you know oh, it's gonna happen next week i gotta stop by the library no let me just have them in my basement or house for a whole year and not worry about it and so that's how i want to frame this and you know having them in the libraries in the rec center sounds great but is it gonna solve the problem just based on the reality that we see in our school system I think the answer will be no. So I think it will be awesome if we already have the hubs where people get food. Maybe we should have places, maybe even in the library where you can buy, where you can get, not buy, when you can get a box of tampons, tampons for the whole, for six months, and you can deliver them per individual. And that's it. Instead of this mentality that you're just gonna put them in the bathrooms hoping that nobody's gonna steal them. Um, so that's how I'm seeing it. And without putting the pressure on the, and I'm sorry to say, cause I'm, you know, 
I don't want to say I'm uh, putting the pressure on the private sector because, you know, but I'm just saying this is more of a society issue, and I think we should see it as a, in a way that we're going to solve it as a society, but, you know, I'll just give you one idea. I don't know if that's the answer. I'm just saying this is where I'm coming from, and maybe we should come back at, at another day and see if that's the way to go. That's how I'm feeling. That's all. That is really helpful. <laughs> Everybody's questions and thoughts and comments, and we're going to get to Councilmember Jawando in just a minute, um, have been immensely enlightening and very helping, uh, helpful, and, and this is really um, starting to take shape. A few, I just want to highlight a, a few follow-ups that I want to make sure you caught, Ms. Wellens. MCPS has been brought up numerous times, so it would be good to get a report from them on um, operationally what this looks like for them. Is it working? Is it not working? Um, lots of examples here in, in, in real time of my own colleagues trying to uh, look for themselves, so that's obviously an issue. Um, and Dr. Ashford, back to you, and, and you don't have to respond, this is another homework assignment, but a recommendation from you all from a public health standpoint, because this is a public health issue, no question, um, on how best to to counsel, well, to Chair Fani Gonzalez's point, how do we un address the underlying issue? Yeah. Um, and Councilmember Sales made made a similar point as well. I think everybody did. Yeah. Um, so that that would be great. And I think that's it. Um, Councilmember Jawando. All right. Thank you. Thank you uh, for all the comments and discussion. That this is this is really helpful. Um, I appreciate you emphasizing the public health aspect. I will come to you, Dr. Ashford, in a second. Uh, I mentioned uh, at an earlier council session, you know, a lot of our job is like layering Swiss cheese. Yep. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and covering as many different holes. And I, I think this issue is no different in that regard that this bill will not solve period poverty, nor was it the goal. It will disproportionately impact folks who are experiencing period poverty uh, and be a, yet another access point for those folks. But it also will, to some of the other things that were mentioned, stigma, uh, uh, equity of availability for something that is just a need for half the population for at least some of their life. Um, and so I see this as just another layer of Swiss cheese. You know, I spoke to the mayor of Ann Arbor, Michigan, who is the one city in the country who's done this for a few years. Um, they haven't charged one fine, uh, and they haven't had mass theft, <laughs> you know, in a city where a lot of people come through. You I know, mean, the University of Michigan's main campus is there, and, and a lot of lot of tourists and things. Um, and so I think the 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 issue of when something is available, there's the less scarcity need of I have to grab it, and 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 it has the benefit I think of also lowering the stigma and just it's it's going to be there i don't have to worry about it it's not a problem for me i feel seen and heard uh and as we heard from some members um i we have talked to mcps about this because they are at uh they're not and i think councilmember lukey mentioned this they're not fully required to have it everywhere yet they're, they're in the kind of the middle of the timeline um or, or the three quarters of the way uh but they're you know our kids where, where there is a scarcity out there are going to act a little different than I think adults are um, and uh, if you had these more available. Um, and so I just, um, you know, wanted to say that I, I don't think, I think the county government should model, the other point I'll make about scope, uh, we should model uh, good behavior and, and do this for our employees and for the public. Um, uh, I, and so I think I appreciate OMB and um, DGS's estimates and DHH, DHHS's uh, input as well. Um, but I do want to really emphasize, I think Councilman Balcom said this really well, like period poverty is an issue, but, and, but so is the other issues around stigma and availability and equity, and they're not exactly the same. Um, and you know, we had DC Diaper Bank, obviously, who supports this bill, who does provide mm -hmm. period products to some of the hubs and to their clients. They never have enough, just like diapers and other things. Um, but they're for it too, because they see that there's there's a there's a layering here. We need both things, uh, and I think we heard that in the testimony. Um, so, you know, I would hope that we could move forward, whether it's a staged approach. Um, 
I do think county government should model, you know, we, we passed the lactation bill, 9-0, last council, that was for county, county buildings, uh, had a fiscal note attached to it. Um, I was proud to support that. I do think um, this is similar in that regard, uh, but even more in that more people menstruate than give birth. <laughs> and, yeah. and so, uh, and it's, uh, I think it's a need. So that's just a commentary and some, you know, just trying to take in in real time what everyone has said. Dr. Ashford, do you have anything just kind of on the topic in general as you've thought about this, prepared for this meeting, that you've thought about the public health aspects of these, especially in light of what I just tried to share and parse out the various meanings? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first, thank you for sponsoring the bill. Um, or you can stop there. Okay. <laughs> full, full stop. We're done. <laughs> um, so I think as has been noted by many of you, menstruation is a normal biological process for women and menstruating people of reproductive age, right? Um, and we know that lack of access to menstruation products can have negative impacts on health, whether that is urinary tract infections, bacterial vaginosis, in rare cases, toxic shock syndrome, right, from prolonged usage. And also, as we have heard from many of you, menstruation is a normal bodily function, um, along with the other bodily functions that happen in public restrooms, right? Um, and there has been lots of data, as Council Member Joanda showed, about how not having access to menstrual products does have negative impacts on ability to go to work, right? We're talking about um, absenteeism, on young people's ability to show up to school because they don't have products to help them when they are having their period. Um, so from a broad perspective, it is very much a public health issue. It's a normal biological function. We don't question about whether we provide toilet paper in the bathrooms, right? Um, and it's a huge equity issue. It's an issue for individuals that menstruate monthly. It is an it's an equity issue for our populations that are experiencing period poverty, which we know are disproportionately black and brown and low um, socioeconomic status individuals. So, you know, I think from an HHS perspective, we are very supportive of this bill. I think there is, um, it's important to have a conversation around some of the implementation and operational um, discussions and um, ensuring that there are resources available, that it's carried out in a way that the council has envisioned. Um, but from a public health per perspective, it's a basic health issue, it's a basic rights issue, and it's an equity issue, and it touches all of those those buckets. And um, yeah. Thank you. And I, I, you made me think of the one other thing I wanted to say on because there's bulk purchasing was mentioned. Another thing, the state of New Jersey had a bill that required the government to do bulk purchasing, yeah. um, which I would imagine if we move forward in whatever staging, but say it's, you know, uh, D DGS uh, could do that. And I was gonna ask, do you, I'm assuming through the contracts you have for other, pro you know, products like toilet paper and toilet tissue and do you already, are you already able to leverage the power of government for bulk, bulk purchasing? Well, to answer your question directly, we would advocate bulk purchasing, of course, but on our current contracts, we have service level requirement contracts, not per item on those other items that are in the restrooms. So they're responsible. Well, explain what service level requirement means. Regardless of the amount used, they're responsible for restocking and purchasing those okay. items. So if you use a hundred or a thousand, they have to meet the service level to always have some in there. And they take that risk as part of their bid Part is process. getting a big contract. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so this would be similarly bid. Similarly, but th this wouldn't cost the, the contractors anything, so they wouldn't have that incentive there. This would be given to them, right. so to speak. So the burden would be on the county and the purchase. To purchase. Or, right, and supply okay. it to them. And then they would, a, they would correct. make sure it's stocked. Correct. Got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you. I've got uh, uh, Councilmember Gl uh, Glass followed by Councilmember Balcom, but um, just two two more follow up items. Um, if we could take a look at Ann Arbor, which was actually just named the most livable city in the United States of America, um, um, that would be terrific. And if we could also look into New Jersey as well uh, as a follow up, Ms. Wellens, uh, Councilmember Glass. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to my colleagues for this thoughtful conversation. 
Um, I purposefully waited to speak because I wanted to hear from the majority women who serve not only on this joint committee but on this council uh, because I think it's really important to hear what their perspective is. It's not my perspective that matters, it's theirs and uh, it's others uh, who were trying to help and uh, there is no doubt that we are trying to help all of our residents live their, their best lives uh, whether it is uh, on a 24-hour cycle or a 27-day cycle or whatever it might be 365 days uh, we want to help everybody and uh, I, I say that not only you know uh, a, a strong feminist but as the son of uh, a woman who had uh, an incredible an incredibly painful diagnosis of endometriosis when she was alive um, and her endometriosis was so bad her OBGYN actually cautioned her not to have children because it was that bad uh, and so uh, despite my gender we talked a lot about periods at home and about how to get through the time period um, and how to keep people healthy during that time um, and so that's how I enter this space and we as a county have dedicated ourselves to having an incredibly strong social safety net we provide homeless services we provide food for those who need it we, we, we even in within our rec department uh, provide sports programmings for kids who need it um, and I absolutely do believe that there is a need to provide menstrual products to people who need it. The question is how do we do that? Um, and much like or exactly like the the other services I mentioned, those are all done through our nonprofit partnership and they are done through the budget process and grant process um, and I do believe that is the best process to provide our residents who are experiencing period poverty with the relief that they need. Um, and, and I appreciate Councilmember Jawando for, for starting this conversation and, the, and, and some of the data points that were mentioned earlier. And I, I, I wrote it down, I think you said that only 4% knew where resources were. That's a problem. And so we got to invest in our organizations that are doing this work, just like the diaper bank and that was the question I asked during the public hearing. I wanted to make sure to see if organizations are doing this work. And they are. Probably not enough of them. Probably not where they need to be done. But they're doing it. And I think as we continue this conversation and there's more information that we're uh, requesting, rightfully, to figure out best practices in other, in other jurisdictions, Come March 15th, we're going to get the county executive's budget. My personal belief is that is the best vehicle to expand services in our community for everybody who needs them. And just like we provide services for people experiencing homelessness, people experiencing food insecurity, we can add people experiencing period poverty to that list. But it would be through the budget, not legislation. So thank you for, for listening to me. Thank you, um, and thank you for sharing that. The lived experiences here, I, I just, it's just very powerful, very powerful, and it just makes me feel even more connected to each of you, so thank you. Uh, Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. I appreciate, um, Councilmember Glass, um, that com your comments, um, because that's, a, that's an intriguing look at um, looking at this from a budgetary perspective versus a legislative perspective as it pertains to count the county buildings. Um, so, um, uh, just, to, just a couple things in terms of f for next time and as we go forward, I think um, certainly the lessons learned from MCPS and then from a non-profit -pro -prof organization perspective, I think it's just really important to get a handle of who's doing what if we're looking at the Swiss cheese model, right? Um, particularly the larger um, organizations. Uh, whether it's the, the, the individual hubs or MANA and, and how that's 
doing. Um, but I think that the community school model, um, I've been so impressed by um, the pantries at the community schools and the services provided because it has really destigmatized uh, parents interacting with the pantries and they come in for all kinds of things. They come in for food, for diapers, for menstrual products, um, but also their programming, um, financial literacy, um, wellness uh, kind of things. And so I wonder if we can look at how we can strengthen and ensure that there is consistent period products for the students of these community schools and how how that could be destigmatized, even if it's just the parents coming in, maybe this maybe the student because these are young for some of them they're very they're the little, our youngest ones, but I think that that's a model. Um, I do want to to just bring up two issues. Uh, one is the, that um, the county, uh, in this budgetary, um, the county should be doing this for our employees in every county building. Um, and that's something that um, we could just do right away because, uh, and, I, and I would be interested in knowing, and this is probably from an HR perspective, I don't know if it's a DGS perspective, but what you know, I know this building does it. Does does uh, the EOB provide products for the employees at EOB, and does you know the other other facilities? Do we provide products for our employees? The answer is no. Right. So I think that's something that we can look at because from from an from an employer's perspective, I think that's something that we that we should certainly look at. Um, and then we haven't we've talked a lot about the county uh, aspect of the bill. I just want to talk about um, the business part. Um, I I don't support uh, the aspect of the bill that requires businesses to provide products. I think the logistics of doing that is um, would be very difficult from from the very beginning of notifying and uh, businesses and enforcement of businesses. But just we're talking about the logistical burden, just from 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 the government's perspective. I think it uh, would be difficult to um, to ask that burden. So I just wanted to uh, express my thoughts on the requirement for businesses. Um, so thank you. Uh, Councilor Jawando. I don't want to jump in front of anyone else. No, no, okay. no. I don't, I think, um, and then I have a suggestion for next steps. Thank you. I appreciate, uh, again, all the comments. I uh, wanted to mention two things. We, yeah, we hadn't focused much on the businesses, so <laughs> let me address that. Uh, we tried to be very uh, flexible in how we provide compliance here, you know, and obviously I read the room I can hear from colleagues you know if you're worried about the county government you're probably worried about the businesses but um, you know it's it's very modest you know with the press conference we had you could similar to what we have in some in this building you could have a, a wicker basket with a set of individually packaged products and you're compliant as a small business um, I, again I think the the idea and I'm glad you said mention you know reach out formally through the committee process to Ann Arbor who again the requirement was for businesses and government um, and and they've been doing that for a number of years and I think as I said it's a best practice for some businesses to do it automatically um, I agree with Councilmember Balcom that we should be providing it at a minimum to our employees and to public facing buildings um, again this is one bill is not going to solve every problem uh, but the requirement that we put on ourselves you know similar to what we did in the in the lactation bill to require lactation rooms in county buildings and uh, and I think putting them in public places of public accommodation at a minimum will start to address this uh, you know as a former lead for libraries you know with with the COVID kits um, mm -hmm. that was something that libraries didn't do uh, and, they, and they and you had to actually you know they started when they were passing them out when they were so few uh, but towards the end and now they just kind of like you walk into a library and they'll just be there like you, you don't have to talk to anybody mm -hmm. you just you just get them mm -hmm. um, which is I think something that would be important here too whether it's in the bathroom outside the bathroom 
Uh, but again, the idea is to expand access for everybody. Um, so those were two things I, I wanted to mention. Uh, and yeah, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Glass. No, I'm okay. Okay. Um, I'll just note Ann Arbor's population is 121,000. So um, it is relevant to find out what they've done and how they're doing it. But, you know, that's about the size of Rockville and Gaithersburg put together. So a um, little bit of apples and oranges, but still definitely relevant. Um, so, Ms. Wellens, um, I'm not going to ask you to run through the checklist of the follow-up items, but I did want to add two more as we're wrapping up here before we I make a recommendation on our, our next steps. Um, when looking at public buildings, I appreciate the macro level look at the number of restrooms. If we could, if it's possible, um, further look at breaking down how many of those restrooms are easily accessible by the public versus ones that are more accessible by staff. Um, you know, it may not be perfect, um, but, but if we could get that breakdown, that would be really helpful. And then Dr. Ashford, I'll just sort of a, a, again underscore again, I think your, your recommendations here will be very salient and important to where we follow up. And if in those recommendations, you all can help us with an analysis um, geographically of where you all believe the highest concentration of needs are. Now, need is everywhere. And, and I do want to note that, you know, within some of our wealthiest zip codes in Montgomery County, there are pockets of very individualized needs. So we have to be careful with that, but but I do think it's a it, it's an important starting point. Can I add? Yes, Councilmember Glass. Uh, thank you for those follow-up items. I'm going to add mm -hmm. uh, one more uh, and goes back to the point I made. Can we follow up with the Office of Grants Management or, or HHS to see which of our service providers are doing this and uh, dive a little deeper into their budget? because I know we don't necessarily have uh, their full operational budgets, but I, I think it is very helpful to see uh, which organizations are doing this. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilmember Juwanda had another point you wanted Thank to Thank you. Make. I forgot what I wanted to say last time. Um, I just wanted to note that, that the Chamber of Commerce addendum packet was added, and uh, they mentioned, if for folks that didn't, might not have saw, seen that, that they were urging the co joint committee to push forward something similar to what DC did, mm, okay. which, which was uh, to require for public buildings and public facing buildings. So they actually were saying do that, you know, uh, which, uh, which I thought was interesting coming from the chambers, not necessarily m maybe people would have thought what they have said, but that's what that's what that letter said. Um, and and to Miss Wellens, I don't think we put that in the packet this time. And I forgot to ask for it, but information on what DC did because I think that's relevant um, in that they, especially given the conversation today, uh, that they passed a, a bill that required uh, in public place, in uh, public buildings, um, government run buildings, and just listing that out, which is what the chamber letter referenced. So I think we should just have access to that as we're figuring out what to do. Thank you. Yes. Just one point of clarity on your request for easily accessible restrooms. I just want to, we yeah. of course have inventory. Yeah. This building may be considered easily accessible for the public, but I don't thank believe you. that that's exactly what you meant. I want to make sure we get Yes, thank you, thank you. Here. I mean, two things. It's a, it's a very important point. So um, the executive office building's first floor is readily accessible to the public, but the subsequent floors on top of that are not, right? Because you have to go through, you know, certain doors. That's what I had in mind. But then in addition to that, and this is where I need public health help, um, sort of where those those concentrations of, of need are, um, you know, based on poverty and, and other factors. That's what I had in mind. Okay, yeah. thank you. Councilor Maluki. Yeah, and just to that point, I mean, when we're talking about, and we talk about this often, with trying to address community needs, um, one of the reasons we're so reliant on our nonprofit partners is because the folks who often need the help the most are reluctant to, to engage directly with government. So, you know, again, I, I appreciate the, you know, I may come to a government building and look for these things if they are there, but would I really? Because 
you're wanting to not engage with the government in that way, but you are wanting to engage with maybe your faith-based institution or your other community access point, or you know, if you're attending English language learning classes and they might be connected with a, a government building through, you know, using space through CUPF, but but that's something that you can match to the program itself, which is the program of their primary interaction as opposed to the building that they may not ever come to, but for the fact that they were doing an, an English language learning class there, for example. So I don't know if we, if we have information readily accessible about that that shows sort of what community spaces are used within our government buildings via CUP where we're engaging with these populations where they would have higher um, impact in that particular building um, because that's again targeting the the resource to the need great um, there's a lot of homework here um, and so I want to be thoughtful and give you all a reasonable runway to be able to come back to us um, Councilmember Glass made the point, and he's he's right that you know obviously if there are budget implications in an ideal world, we would be able to have this coincide with the FY25 budget planning process. But it may not be a perfect world because we we want to make sure that we're thoughtful about this. So why don't we set a target date of early April for Ms. Wellens to reach out to the corresponding agencies that are conducting their due diligence, and you all provide feedback to her on whether you need more time. Um, and why don't we target tentatively um, mid-April for a follow-up work session, um, which may be challenging because we'll be in the midst of budget deliberations. So we'll see how that goes, but you know we can set it as a target and um, we'll follow up after that. Does that sound reasonable, colleagues? Yes. Okay. All right, um, thank you all so much. Director Stowe, you're the one person who hasn't had an opportunity to, to weigh in. I'll, why don't I give you the last <laughs> word, sir? Or if you're good, you're good. All right, then. Um, thank you all very much. This has been very productive and helpful. And with that, we are adjourned. My bad. There is another oh. item. There is another item. Oh. Oh. My oh. fault. Yeah. My oh. fault. Oh. Yeah. Oh, My bad. Uh, we are back in joint <laughs> committee session. Um, Ms. Wellens, why don't you help us with no. the uh, next conversation? Um, certainly the next conversation is Council Bill 4423, Human Rights and Civil Liberties, Prospective Employees, Healthcare Privacy, uh, sponsored by lead sponsors, Council Members Albernos and Lukey, co-sponsors, uh, Council Member Katz, yes. Council Vice President Stewart, and Council it is Member Jamondo. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and so this bill um, is sort of inspired by and sort of an offshoot of an earlier bill um, led by Councilmember Ludke, um, Bill 523, which uh, provided some um, health care privacy protections to prospective county employees, um, in particular limiting the questions that the county could ask of prospective employees about um, their, in, in their personal health information to the extent that it was not necessary for determining whether the person was qualified for the job, um, and also um, strictly banning questions about uh, sexual health or reproductive health information. So this bill would essentially extend those same provisions into the private sector um, so that employers you know, similarly would be restricted in their ability to ask um, prospective employees about health information. So um, I guess what I would like to do, if it's okay with the chair, is just to sort of highlight how this bill interplays with other laws, just because of course we have extensive protections under the state law and under uh, the federal law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and this issue was raised during public testimony of why would we need this? We already have these protections. Um, and so interestingly, what was kind of discovered through the process of Bill 523 is that despite these extensive protections, the county still, you know, being compliant with those laws was still asking uh, some very detailed um, and arguably not pertinent you know, questions of every job applicant 
um, including you know sexual and reproductive health, um, including things that were just arguably um, not necessary for what their job duties would be. Um, and in particular, there's a couple ways in which uh, Bill 4423 would goes above and beyond the uh, requirements of the state and federal law. Um, for one thing, it applies to all employees, all, all employers and like the ADA, uh, which applies to the employers with 15 or fewer employees. Um, it allows medical questions only to the extent they are necessary to determine whether the candidate candidate meets job qualifications that have been published prior to the acceptance of applications. Bans has the outright ban on asking applicants about reproductive or sexual health. Um, and then also it permits enforcement by our um, county's office uh, uh, on human rights under chapter 27 on the code and includes those penalties. Um, and I would just point out to the committee, it's not unusual for there to be overlapping anti-discrimination or civil rights laws at the local state and uh, federal level to provide those additional resources and enforcement mechanisms. Um, so that's the background I wanted to provide and then we have Thanks, Ms. Rollins. I, I needed a V8 uh, this afternoon, but thank you so much. Um, so I, I'm going to say a few things and then turn it over to my, my co-lead sponsor here, Councilmember Ludke. But um, I was so impressed by my colleagues on the council who identified very quickly when they were onboarding the very inappropriate uh, and outdated questions that were required through um, our Office of Human Resources and made clear that, um, especially in light of the world that we're living in right now, which is terrifying, and the legislation that was passed in Alabama um, just a couple of weeks ago further underscores that um, women in our country are under attack in a way that I haven't seen in my lifetime. And so it's very important that um, all of our county residents, but particularly those that are uh, have very sensitive personal information that should remain personal, uh, that we take every step within reason uh, to help address that confidentiality. And uh, that further also sends the message that this is a welcoming community um, in a variety of different ways. And so um, I was proud to serve as code lead for all of those and more reasons. And I feel that the same protections that have now been made available to our county employees should be made, made available to all employees here in Montgomery County. But with that, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Lukey to make some opening comments. Thank you. Um, I was very grateful for everyone's support on, on the county employee bill last year. Um, and, and as noted, our court decisions, depending on which state you're in, have been challenging lately, um, in addition to the Dobbs decision of the Supreme Court. Um, and so, you know, there are state laws that do protect the um, screening process for prospective employees, as well as our federal laws. Um, but yet, as we noted, with our own employee form for county employees prior to the passage of 5-23, there was still wiggle room there to pry into things that need not be known. Um, when talking to private employers in the county about the bill, the first reaction everybody gave me was, oh my goodness, people were really asking that, right? And yet, they were, and they are. It may not be the ones I spoke to, but I think that there is a clear policy objective where we need to express our outward and firm commitment to making sure that those who are working inside our county are not subjected to that by their employers. Um, and I've also heard arguments related to workers' compensation claims, right? In the, well, if, if that wasn't disclosed at the time we hired them and then later they have a workers' comp claim, well, later you can get the information if it becomes relevant, if and when there ever is a workers' compensation claim. But it is not relevant at the time that you're offering the person the job. And the very fact of the matter that a question may teeter into that area allows or puts a em prospective employee on the spot of over-disclosing something that once the genie's out of the, the bottle can't be put back in and at, results in an adverse determination in employee employee hiring. So this is a much clearer way of making sure we're adhering to all of our protections um, by both our pub 
not just our public employees uh, here in the county under the prior law that passed, but for all uh, workers here within Montgomery County. And with that, I yield. Thank you. Um, so I guess the, the bottom line here is, as Ms. Wellens mentioned, although there are protections, both federal and state, um, there, are, there is enough ambiguity that is the reason why we are putting this forward. Um, Director Stowe, um, a lot falls under the responsibility of your very important office here in our community, and although we've been able to add some, not nearly as many, but some positions, um, I'd just love to hear from your perspective any thoughts you have regarding this proposed legislation. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, to Mr. Chairman and members of council. Uh, let me first of all say that the county executive is enthusiastically supports this particular measure. Uh, and so we look forward to it progressing. Um, as we look at this particular bill and as it relates then to coming into law for Montgomery County, for those of us who are enforcing these particular laws, uh, as you know, our, our business, as it were, is done by complaints that come into us, uh, those that we, in fact, sometimes can go out and find, out, find uh, uh, in, in the marketplace, as it were. Uh, so we'll be depending upon, obviously, people complaining or filing a complaint with us that they believe that their interaction, their interview process, or the hiring decision has something to do with information that they may, in fact, have had to provide and they may have thought that in fact was unfair. So we'll be looking forward then to sort of hearing back from them. So for, uh, for as far as we're concerned on the investigatory side, uh, it's another question we might ask uh, uh, someone in terms of the investigation. Do you think then that this may have been a situation that you encountered as a result of the, this uh, decision or in fact your complaint? And so we'll be dependent upon individuals to actually bring that matter to our attention. Um, the other thing we always deal with as a frustration point and also a bit of a challenge as well is how do we inform that worker that they have these rights uh, to know what to look for as they're in that interview process is there anything if it's a written a questionnaire as an example is there something on that written questionnaire that just doesn't seem right uh, how do we get to them let them know that there may be something we want to further investigate at least ask a question of our office etc sort of see whether or not that may in fact be the case so that that would be a bit of a challenge for us to kind of get the word out there let people know that they have this right to pursue uh, their particular complaint if they if they choose to and have us follow up on it at that time so we don't see there being a big issue vis-a-vis -vis through implementation uh, we did hear back from our uh, office of labor relations they didn't seem to suspect that there was an issue there as well and so I think we're going to be okay in implementation going forward. But again, it's getting the word out, informing folks, and letting them know how they can file a complaint. Thank you. I, I didn't mention a very important segment of our population where this is acutely important as well, and that's our transgender population. Um, and so ensuring that we work with the advocacy community that is supporting these communities will, will definitely be very important. Councilmember Lukey. Thank you. I just, um, I wanted for benefit of the discussion, especially given in the post-COVID world, even more than, than before when remote working was possible, but it, it's become more of an ongoing uh, thing now, um, that our code where the definition that's cross-referenced in this bill for employer means anybody who employs one or more individuals in the county. So the employer doesn't need to be in Montgomery County. They just need to employ someone who is in the county. Um, and so that's something that I think is critically important because we may have a county resident who is applying for a job with a company that may not be located here in the county. Um, they get interviewed on Zoom and uh, they're asked these kinds of questions that we are not allowing. So um, I just wanted to clarify and, and get Ms. Wellen's input about that applying in those situations as well. I mean, so I think my answer is I would like to follow up about the specific definition of employer and how that's been applied in similar contexts mm -hmm. to just better wrap our heads around the concept of the employer's not located here but is employing, say, one person here. Um, I do think that I don't want to speak off the cuff of whether that is totally, that it, that totally is understood. Covered. Um, and it would be good to know, again, whether that definition in 26, 27-6 has ever been utilized in that way for any other type of, um, you know, um, discrimination provision. 
uh, Councilman Luke, we'll, we'll look at that as well. Uh, but I will say that maybe we're implementing the sick and safe leave law as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, we did, in fact, have employees that were housed or, in fact, employed in a site within Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. And they did fall under our law. Right. Well, not they, in fact, their home office, as it were, or the uh, bulk of their particular employee public community was outside of our particular jurisdiction. We did, in fact, in fact, in, 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 in this case, uh, the jurisdiction, we, in fact, try to make sure, in fact, apply to employees that were actually in our county. Right. And that's how we look at it on all the other issues as well, okay. currently. Great. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. I'll also just note, you know, this, this is a joint um, session with our Economic Development Committee. I have had the opportunity to speak to our representatives from the various chambers who are supportive of this measure. Um, given especially that it won't add any additional costs to the businesses themselves and there are reasonable exemptions when the information is relative to the job that they're applying for specifically. Um, there were no objections or concerns from our private sector that were raised with me. So, um, in fact, they supported the bill. So, uh, I don't see any other questions or thoughts or comments. So then, um, without objection, colleagues, um, we'll We'll, we'll advance this to the full council. Uh, and between now and then, Ms. Wellens, if you can respond to Councilmember Lukey's question, that would be great. Will do, thank you. All right, now I think we, <laughs> I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything, Ms. Wellens. Is there anything else on the agenda? Are we good? I believe you're good. All right, then, <laughs> and now we truly are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. I, I, was, I was so confused. I, 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 I,